Well, good evening. Thank you all for joining us again for another round of our Faith Forum. Glad to see all of you here today on this rainy evening. Hopefully you didn't get too wet on your way in. Uh, we are looking forward to continuing our journey. Um, this will be a, the last of our weeks looking at the persons of the Trinity. So uh, we'll look at the Holy Spirit today. Again, there is a little summary of, in a nutshell. If you want to pick one of those up on your way out or your way in, I won't necessarily follow that outline exactly in my talking points, but it will refer you to where in the compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church or the full catechism you can find points for further reading or for review. And for those who are joining us via the miracle of YouTube, listening to this as a podcast, I believe there will be a link to that in a nutshell summary in the description for this video. So, let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Dear Holy Spirit, our paraclete and advocate, our consoler, our counselor and guide, come. Stir the fire of your love within our hearts, within our minds, within our entire beings. Draw us more deeply into relationship with you. Help us to come to know and understand you more deeply. Draw us ever more deeply into the mystery of the blessed life that you share with the Father and the Son, our God forever and ever. Amen. So we continue our journey looking at the Holy Trinity. I spoke here, I guess it would be about three weeks ago now, about the reality of God desiring to share his own blessed life with us. He creates us freely to be in relationship with him, and he continues, the very first paragraph of the Catechism tells us, to draw close so that we can come to know him and to love him and ultimately to share his life if we're willing to cooperate with his grace. At the heart of our faith is not a set of doctrines or truths that we believe and to which we ascend, although we do have those. At the heart of our faith is not a a set of ethical and moral guidelines. We do have that too. The heart of our faith is someone, God. And as he has made himself known, actually a community of persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the last two weeks, we have looked at the Father and we have looked at the Son, and we will now look at the Holy Spirit today. So it starts with the question of who is the Holy Spirit? God has revealed something of his inner life, through divine revelation, as it's been passed down by the church's teaching office, the magisterium in scripture and tradition. So we have come to understand from what God shares with us that he exists as one God in three distinct divine persons who share this one divine nature. Each one is fully God And they're distinguished by their particular relationship to each other. So, for instance, we speak about the Father as the one who is unbegotten. And the Son is the only begotten one. We speak in the Creed about the Holy Spirit as the one who proceeds from the Father and the Son. That's the particular relationship that defines the third person of the Trinity, 
The three persons of the Trinity are really defined by their relationships to one another. If you're already feeling like you're treading in really deep waters, uh, join the club. If I could really explain it to you, I would be God. And if you could really understand it, you would be God. And since that's not the case, we kind of bump up against something that God has made known, but we're we're never going to exhaust the meaning. We're never going to fully grasp this reality, which in a way is kind of exciting because it means I can always have new insights into who each of the persons of the Trinity are, how they exist as one God and three divine persons, because I'm never going to exhaust this mystery. Well, we can think of it this way. God's very essence is love. It is self-gift. So we see from all eternity, the Father pours himself out, giving himself completely and entirely so that the Son is everything that the Father is, except he's not the Father. And the Son, from all eternity, has been receiving this gift from the Father, and reciprocating it by pouring himself out so completely and totally, giving himself so fully to the Father that that the Father is everything that the Son is, except he's not the Son. And this gift of self, this love that's poured out between the Father and the Son is so perfect and complete that that's the third person of the Trinity. One of my seminary professors described it as something like this, and the great communion of love that is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Father and Son look at each other with great love. And they breathe forth the Holy Spirit, the shared love between them. St. Thomas Aquinas called it spiration, that the Father and the Son spirate the Holy Spirit, which is kind of an interesting way of speaking about the particular position or role or relationship to the Father and Son that the Holy Spirit has. In the Nicene Creed, we say it as the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. This description of thinking about two who love one another and the love that's shared between them, and because this is God, it's complete and perfect, that shared love is the third person of the Trinity. This is who the Holy Spirit is. Much like with the Father and the Son, there's a particular role or work or mission that we tend to associate more with the Holy Spirit than with the other two persons of the Trinity. We tend to associate creation most with the Father. But since the Holy Trinity is inseparable, all of the works that they do outside of themselves, so outside of God, they always do together. So in creation, as the church fathers were somewhat fond of saying, the Father creates, but he cannot create. He creates by speaking, which means he cannot create without his word and without his breath, or the Hebrew word is ruach, which can be translated spirit as well as breath. So here you see in creation, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We could say something similar about the work of redemption, which we associate most closely with the Son, because the Son is the only person of the Holy Trinity that assumed a human nature and became incarnate and suffered and died on a cross and was buried and rose again. So it's understandable that we do associate redemption and salvation most closely with the Son. But as Jesus makes clear throughout the gospel, especially in John chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, how closely he is united with the Father. He says that I do nothing on my own. I say only what I hear from the Father. I do the works I see the Father doing. I judge as the Father tells me to judge. They're together in this work. We also see the Holy Spirit at work in Jesus' ministry. He becomes incarnate by the Holy Spirit. He is anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. John the Baptist describes Jesus as the one on whom he sees the Spirit descend and remain. So again, we see here accompanying the Son 
in his work of redemption, the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity always working together in this work of redemption. We associate the Holy Spirit most with the work of salvation or sanctification, the ongoing work of making us holy, making us sharers in the salvation that Jesus won for us. Again, here, the Father and the Son are also at work. This is not exclusively the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, I want to be very honest. I don't have really great examples to illustrate that. Because one of the challenges we have is that the Holy Spirit is a little bit more difficult to get our minds around. Father and Son conjure up in our minds very concrete imagery. Hopefully for you it's good imagery. Not all of us have had the best experience with our parents, so maybe it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but hopefully it's mostly good. But when we think about Holy Spirit, it's a little more vague. It's not as concrete. The images that we use for the Holy Spirit, dove, fire, strong wind, column of cloud, they're... They're concrete enough, but but they're not really personal images. I don't really think of having a personal relationship with a fire. I mean, I like sitting next to a fire, especially when it's cold outside, but I don't really take up a conversation with a fire. It's not something I do. I'm strange, but I'm not that strange. (laughs) So I think that's part of the challenge. But if we press in maybe a little bit to some of the ways that the Holy Spirit was prefigured, in the Old Testament, we might gain some insights uh, into how the Holy Spirit works, or even just considering some of the titles of the Holy Spirit. I sort of highlight the, the work of the Holy Spirit that we associate most with him, that work of sanctification. Let's maybe start with the titles of the Holy Spirit. So throughout, especially the New Testament, we hear Jesus referring to the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. Um, In Greek, parakletos literally means someone that walks alongside. And it was used particularly in a courtroom. The paraclete would be something like the defense attorney in our legal system. The one who accompanies me in this, the one who speaks in this. And you see this in especially the Last Supper discourse where Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. The one who will come, who will accompany you so that you're not left orphans. The one who will guide you into all truth. The paraclete also had this role of defending the person against the accuser. Uh, By by the way... um, Satan in Hebrew was sort of like the prosecuting attorney in our legal system, which is where we get the word Satan, the accuser. Just an interesting little aside, the Holy Spirit, in a sense, counteracts this. Another title of the Holy Spirit that Jesus uses is advocate. Even in our legal system, sometimes we refer to a defense attorney or someone who undertakes something on behalf of another, an advocate. This is someone who is going to speak for the other to defend them if necessary. We also see St. Paul speaking about this when he says in Romans chapter 8 that we don't know how to pray as we ought. And so the Spirit intercedes on our behalf with groanings that cannot be expressed in speech. This is another way of sort of advocating on our behalf and helping to articulate the deep desires in our heart. We see how in in paraclete and advocate, there's a sense that the Holy Spirit is now the the person of the Holy Trinity that's most prominently accompanying us through our journey through this life. Yes, the Father and the Son certainly are still very much involved. We're called to have a relationship with each each of the three persons of the Trinity. But in a way, the, the Holy Spirit in this role of advocate, paraclete, is the one that accompanies us in this journey. The Holy Spirit is also often referred to as the consoler the one who comforts us, the one who encourages us. We see this maybe most in the martyrs, whose great courage is given to them by the Holy Spirit so that they are able to bear witness to the faith. 
The Holy Spirit also is referred to as the Spirit of Truth. That's particularly spoken of by Jesus when he says that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth and remind you of all that I told you. Some weeks back we spoke about divine revelation and how the Holy Spirit guides the magisterium of the church to hand on that deposit of faith, all that God has revealed through scripture and tradition, without error, and to be able to define what's contained in that deposit of faith and matters of faith and moral with certainty. So the Holy Spirit, as the spirit of truth, is the one who guides particularly the magisterium of the church, the Pope in union with the bishops in articulating what God has revealed and helping us recognize and understand more deeply what we believe, what God has revealed, what it means for our life today. This too is part of the Holy Spirit's ongoing work in our lives. The Holy Spirit is also referred to as the Spirit of the Lord or the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the promise. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit. He promised that the Holy Spirit would come and make possible the continued proclamation of God's revelation, the continued proclamation of the good news of salvation through Jesus' death and resurrection. As I've spoken about this, the Holy Spirit being the shared love between the Father and the Son really is, in a sense, the essence of God. God is love. And in giving us the Holy Spirit, God allows us to share in his love, which is such a wonderful gift. Like the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit is revealed slowly over time. It begins in the Old Testament, where even at the very beginning, I spoke about creation already, God speaks. He has his word and his breath, as the church fathers point out. Genesis 1 also mentions that there is a formless void. There are waters, and the Spirit hovers over the waters. So already we see the Holy Spirit present even at the first moments of creation, at least in a dim foreshadowing. Throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit speaks through the prophets. You can, if you read the Old Testament closely, get a sense of various points. It's said that people are filled with the Holy Spirit. When David is anointed by Samuel as the king of the Israelites, it's said that the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. There's a point in the book of the prophet Daniel where it's said that Daniel is stirred by the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the Lord. So we get this sense that the Holy Spirit is the one that's inspiring the prophecies of the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit appears to be the one that's kind of encouraging them in their mission, encouraging leaders like Moses, leaders like David, and, and so on. We see the Holy Spirit foreshadowed in the wandering through the wilderness, in the pillar of cloud and fire that accompanied the Israelites. And also in the pillar of cloud that descended upon the meeting tent, which during their wilderness wanderings was sort of their portable temple, until they finally got settled in the Holy Land and a few centuries later under King David and King Solomon built a more permanent temple in Jerusalem. And actually the column of cloud came at the consecration and dedication of that temple and, and filled this. Again, a sense of the Spirit of the Lord coming to fill what is his kind of dwelling place or footstool here on earth. These are all ways that the Holy Spirit is foreshadowed. He comes more to the fore during the New Testament when Jesus is here during the Incarnation. Jesus becomes incarnate by the Holy Spirit. And from that moment, Jesus is anointed. We see in a couple of different places in the Gospels, Jesus' baptism, the Spirit descending like a dove, the transfiguration, that bright shining cloud that casts a shadow over the three apostles, Peter, James, and John, that are there with Jesus. Again, seeing the Holy Spirit a little bit more clearly, everything that Jesus has to say about the Holy Spirit. And then finally, we get to the resurrection, to the end of Jesus' ministry here on earth. 
And he now breathes in John chapter 20, the evening of Easter Sunday, breathes the Holy Spirit on the apostles to give them the power to forgive sins. And then later, 50 days after Easter, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit will be fully manifested. And we enter into a new stage. So to speak, the the mission of the Son has accomplished what it needed to accomplish. Now, in a sense, the prominent role is handed over to the Holy Spirit so that the mission of the Son to come and to fully reveal God and to realize salvation passes on to the Holy Spirit and the church. The Holy Spirit continues to guide the church in proclaiming God's revelation and continuing the mission that Jesus gives to go make disciples from all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. That really is the mission of the church. We are to be the agents through whom God draws people into communion with himself, through whom God rescues people from the kingdom of darkness and brings them into the kingdom of his beloved Son. And the Holy Spirit has the role as the most prominent member of the Trinity in bringing that about through the church, through you and through me. You and I are to be these agents, these visible instruments through which God wants to work. That's why it's crucial for us to develop a relationship not only with the Father and the Son, but also with the Holy Spirit, because he will be the one that's sort of at the forefront among the Trinity in this work of proclaiming the good news of salvation, of making disciples, of evangelizing the world, of being in cooperation with God's grace, these agents, these visible signs through which God can draw people into communion with himself. So it really is a great and wonderful mission, a great and challenging mission that we are given as baptized Christians. And the Holy Spirit will help us to accomplish that mission because we certainly can't do it without it. So much so, if you read in the, I don't remember now if it's the end of the Gospel of Luke or if it's at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. If you don't know this, Luke actually wrote the Acts of the Apostles as the sequel to his Gospel. In one of those two places, right as Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, he tells the Apostles... They're going to be commissioned to go out and to bear witness and preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins and proclaim the gospel. And he tells them that before they do this, they're to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the spirit that was promised to them. It's not until they have received the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that they begin this mission of going out and making disciples and and bearing witness to the gospel. So the Holy Spirit is key to this missionary work and task that Jesus wants to accomplish through the church that he established. And that's the great opportunity that you and I have to share in this with the Lord through cooperating with his Holy Spirit. So if we look at the church and the role the Holy Spirit plays within the church, um, the Catechism summarizes several things that the Holy Spirit does. One is that as this mystical body of Christ, the Holy Spirit builds and animates and sanctifies this body of Christ. The Holy Spirit also guides the organization. St. Paul speaks about this pretty extensively in his first letter to the Corinthians when he compares the mystical body of Christ to the human body, that we have many different parts. Each part has its different role and place. Each part is necessary just because one is maybe more 
visible or prominent doesn't mean it's somehow more important or has more value to the body. And the Holy Spirit helps guide this um, equipping of the church with everything that's necessary to accomplish this work and organizes the body of Christ. We tend to group these two gifts of the Holy Spirit or various things that the Holy Spirit gives to the members of the church for the purpose of this mission under two categories. There are the hierarchical gifts of the Holy Spirit, which the ordained ministry shares in, and there are the charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit, which all the baptized share in. The hierarchical gifts help to be the way that the Holy Spirit works to organize and direct the church through the work that the ordained have of sanctifying, particularly through the sacraments, teaching, particularly through the proclamation of the word and the teachings of the church, and governing. Governing is that role of of leadership, of guiding and organizing the church. And that particularly applies to how we identify, recognize, and organize and direct the various gifts and charisms that are given among the body of Christ, the baptized Christian people. Some people think of charisms as being somewhat like Catholics who are trying to be Pentecostals. Sometimes the charisms will manifest that way. There are charisms of praise. There are charisms of speaking in tongues. There are charisms of healing. There are charisms of prophecy and words of insight. These are very real charisms. There are also other charisms that are maybe not as prominent. There are charisms of hospitality. There are charisms of generosity, mercy, justice. Charisms of facilitating and helping. Things that work more in the background that help make things possible. Like the people who make sure that sound is on here in the hall and everything is set up for me and I just have to walk in and start. These two are charisms. There are charisms of preaching and teaching and lots of other different types of gifts. If you want to learn a lot more about the whole broad range of charisms, I recommend looking up the St. Catherine of Siena Institute and their called and gifted inventory, which helps identify the charisms that I might be given. So part of the role of a pastor of a parish is to try and recognize charisms that are given among the members of the parish and try to put people in ministries that work well for that. If a person has a charism of hospitality, it's probably better to have them out where they can exercise that with people rather than putting them back in the back room to, I don't know, stock the shelves in the kitchen or something. That's someone who has a charism of service or of facilitating and helping, which is just as necessary as hospitality. It's, just, it's a different kind of work of the Holy Spirit, but all given by the same Lord. So that's how they all work together. So those gifts are given, they're given for the benefit of others. Um, I will just use myself as an example at the risk of sounding maybe a little conceited. Based on the feedback I have received, I suspect I have been given a pretty good dose of the charism of preaching. And... If you looked at me prior to ordination, earlier in my life, you might have seen some glimpses of that. That there's maybe a a gift for for speaking in public and kind of an ease in that. But if you look closely, you would have also seen that I was often uneasy, sometimes rushed, worried about making sure I remembered all my points. Um, I've had people since ask over the years of ministry of the last 14 years, you know, when I really became at ease. And I've reflected on that a lot. I have to say, honestly, it was after my diaconate ordination when Holy Mother Church tasked me with preaching to the people of God for their benefit. And like that's when it started to really click. And there's now an ease that I didn't experience before. There is, from what people share with me, an impact on them, a help to them. 
Because the charisms are always given for the benefit of others. They're not given to make me look good. They're given for your benefit. And if I cooperate with them and put them to use for the benefit of others, they help me to grow in holiness. And that's another role that the Holy Spirit carries out in the church. The Holy Spirit, as his name suggests, sanctifies or makes holy, makes us share in Jesus' own life and love, the very life of God. From the moment of our baptism, we receive a share in God's life that dwells in us. We call it sanctifying grace. It's an indwelling presence of the Trinity through the Holy Spirit. That sanctifying grace remains, provided that I do not commit mortal sin. We'll talk more in later faith forums about different types of sin and how we recognize it. In brief, it's grave matter that I commit knowingly and willingly. I can think of times in my life when I knew it was seriously wrong, and I chose to do it anyway. Ring up a big one. If I find myself in that state, no need to fear, the sacrament of penance is available. That's how, among other things, in addition to the forgiveness and reconciliation with God and the church, that gift of sanctifying grace is restored if it is lost after baptism. So the Holy Spirit helps to sanctify us. And the Holy Spirit prompts us if we're willing to start to become more attentive. Those little encouragements throughout the day that prompt me to do good, that alert me that I'm approaching maybe temptation or a time in my life when I'm likely to be tempted. I get that little nudge that tells me I need to maybe do something different. That's the Holy Spirit knocking on the door saying, Hey, bud, you're cruising for a bruising. It's time to change course. Or those little inspirations that, you know, I, I need to take care of this. Or it would be really nice for my wife if I took care of that. Or that's the Holy Spirit prompting me to, to do good, to choose virtue. To give of myself for the benefit of others. Each time I do these things and cooperate with these inspirations, whether it's turning away from potential sin or rejecting temptation or it's choosing to do good and choosing the path of virtue, I grow. I grow in holiness. I become more like God. I let Jesus have more room to live his life and love in and through me. All of that happens by the facilitation of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit really has a very important role in our lives. And I would love to say that I have a great relationship with the Holy Spirit and we're best buds. But I would be lying. I think like a lot of people that I have met, I tend to spend a lot of time with the Father and with the Son. Probably for a lot of the same reasons I've already shared. That it's just more concrete. It's just kind of where I began. But slowly I'm becoming more deliberate about asking the Holy Spirit for guidance and including the Holy Spirit in the conversation when I'm in prayer. But it's taking some time. So I just encourage you, if if the Holy Spirit maybe feels like it's the the least well-known of the Holy Trinity for you, that you are not alone. There are lots of us in that boat who are kind of working through that. But... Also to just be encouraged that if we are asking the Holy Spirit to help us know him more, to help us love him more, to teach us how to be in relationship with him, he'll answer that. He'll take that up. Because God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit tirelessly invites us into relationship with him. Never gets tired of inviting us into that relationship. So just an encouragement, if the Holy Spirit is maybe a little more distant for you, to start including the Holy Spirit in your prayer, to start invoking the Holy Spirit. Maybe as you begin a new task, just come Holy Spirit, be with me as I undertake this. If you have to make a decision, especially if it's a decision of more weight or moment, to ask the Holy Spirit to guide me. As I weigh the factors in this decision, Holy Spirit, help me see what needs to be done. 
as I'm planning my week and kind of looking at my calendar. It's great to just say to the Holy Spirit, okay, I've kind of penciled out what I think I ought to do. What do you want to do? Be careful when you make that prayer, because oftentimes he just kind of comes in and says, okay, you know, get rid of this, get rid of that. Nope, we're not doing that. We're going to do this. And sometimes that happens just through the events of life. But the point is to cultivate relationship with the Holy Spirit, just like we cultivate relationship with anyone else. We have to spend time. We need to speak to each other. We need to listen. So be present, speak, listen. Just as we would with the Father and the Son, we do the same with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit also helps us in being witnesses. This is particularly true through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We probably learned about them when we were preparing for the Sacrament of Confirmation, which is the sacrament that we associate most closely with the Holy Spirit. It confers a particular gift of the Holy Spirit that strengthens what began at our baptism. And the prayer that is prayed over those to be confirmed calls to mind what have come to be known as the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can find them in Isaiah chapter 11. They are wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, piety, courage, and fear of the Lord. You're trying to write those all down. I'll go over them again one by one. So don't worry. You won't miss out. I'm going to talk about them particularly in relationship to following Christ as his disciple and and being witnesses to his gospel. So wisdom is the gift that helps us to see things more from God's perspective. This is especially helpful when we encounter things that are difficult or challenging, sufferings, trials, disappointments, griefs, things that I just don't really understand what's going on here. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps me to see a little bit more from God's perspective. What might God be doing in permitting this to happen in my life? How is the Father inviting me to grow in faith or hope or charity or other virtues through this experience? What does the Father want me to learn from this experience? And the Holy Spirit will help me to come to some sense of what that is. And that's the gift of wisdom. So I see more from God's perspective. Knowledge helps me to know God more fully and truly, and also to know myself more as I am known by God, more truly. That helps me to live the virtue of humility. That's a true knowledge and acceptance of myself as I'm known and accepted by God. That too helps. So in order to be a witness to the gospel, it's never been popular. It's not popular today. It wasn't popular in pretty much any era of human history. I don't know if it's ever really going to be popular. Humility and the knowledge that gets me there are very helpful because I'm less concerned about what other people think. I don't need to please them. I don't need to worry if they criticize me. Like I know who God is. I know who I am. And knowledge is the gift that helps me with that. Understanding helps me to have insight into what we believe, into the mysteries of our faith. It's not necessarily an understanding that I'll be able to articulate in words, As one person put it, it's just this kind of sense that I know that I know that I know. This is true. This is good. This is what God asks. God is at work here. I don't really know how to explain it. I just know that I know. That's the gift of understanding. The gift of counsel helps us in the particular judgments and decisions that we have to make on a day-to-day basis to choose more and more in line with what God asks of us and to see more clearly what that is. The gift of piety comes from the Latin word for a child. So it helps me to live in childlike relationship to God, childlike confidence, childlike trust, knowing that I am a child of God, beloved of the Father. A gift of counsel or piety, 
helps me remember that. Then there's the gift of fear of the Lord, which is a little bit difficult to understand. It is a certain fear or reverence toward God. It's kind of like the fear that I feel of harming someone in a relationship I have with someone whom I know loves me deeply. When I've come to know God more fully and his love for me, I don't want to harm that. And there's a certain fear that comes with that that is helpful because it makes me want to choose what will keep me in relationship with God and want to avoid what will take me out of relationship with God. That's why the Psalms and other parts of the Old Testament describe the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. And finally, there's courage. Courage is that gift that helps us to persevere despite the difficulties that we may encounter. That's particularly important in being a disciple and in giving witness because we are going to encounter difficulty, just as Jesus did in the Gospels. Some people accepted him and some people didn't. The same will be true for you and me. Some will accept that we're intentional disciples and we're really trying to live this way. And we invite them to join us. And some will be interested or curious. Some will be really excited. And some may be downright hostile. And some might be just indifferent. Courage allows me to persevere despite those difficulties. So these seven gifts of the Holy Spirit help me to follow Jesus more closely, participate in the mission of the church of being the visible agents through whom God draws people into communion with himself and giving witness to his gospel. A final way that the Holy Spirit does that is by cultivating through his little inspirations and guidance that prompt us to do good and avoid evil the fruits of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul lists them in Galatians chapter 5. They can be a really good examination of conscience. They can be a really good sort of check from time to time to see, you know, is my prayer and my participation in the sacraments and whatever kind of works of mercy or service I do, whether it's in my family or in the community, like, is it bearing fruit? Is it on target? Well, I can look to see... Do I see the fruits of the Holy Spirit start to pop up in my life? Again, in Galatians chapter 5, St. Paul lists the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, generosity, self-control. It's a good examination of conscience to look at my life. If I see that those fruits are growing, I can be confident that even if maybe my experience of the sacraments doesn't seem to have any fireworks or clear, conscious sense of God, even if maybe my prayer feels really quiet and kind of dry and arid and I'm not quite sure where God is in this, if I see that the fruits of the Spirit is still there. It's working. I may not be consciously aware of how it's working, but it is working. And if I'm starting to notice that the fruits of the Spirit are lacking, I need to maybe go back and reevaluate how I'm pursuing the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to show me, are there some areas where I'm I'm just missing something or I need to grow? Are there some things that would be helpful that maybe I did at one point in my life, but I've just kind of gotten out of the habit. I've gotten a little bit negligent, maybe a little bit slothful in this or that area of my relationship with God. The fruits of the Holy Spirit can help to highlight that. And they help to encourage when, you know, God doesn't always seem particularly close. I don't have a conscious awareness of God. And and seeing the fruits of the Holy Spirit that they're still there in my life, you know, encourages me that, okay, for whatever reason, God is calling me to walk more by faith, walk without as much of a felt sense of his presence in my life. But he's still with me and it's still working because I can see that the fruits of the Holy Spirit are there. What I want to close with today are the Holy Spirit and and the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the essential human questions. We've been talking about them throughout our faith forum because they're really important. Um, 
when they start to come alive in, in the light of our faith, um, it really brings the, the so what factor home. Okay, so God has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three divine persons and one God. So what? What does it have to do with anything? We go to the essential human questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? We can get a, a better sense of that so what factor. We've spoken about who I am. I'm a beloved child of God. Made in his image and likeness. Yeah, I'm also a sinner. Someone who has broken that relationship and forgot who I am. But a sinner who is loved. A sinner that has offered redemption through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And now we can add to that, I am one in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. One loved by God enough that the Holy Spirit wants to come and live in me. This is who I am. This is who you are. This is who every person is invited to be. We can also add to the question of why I'm here. That I'm here ultimately to cooperate with God's loving plan of salvation for me. Under the guidance and by the working of the Holy Spirit. So that I am able to get to where am I going. That communion with God for all eternity in the kingdom of heaven. It's an amazing gift and amazing privilege that the Holy Spirit wants to guide us into this life, wants to give us the opportunity to cooperate in God's loving plan, and so be able to enter into that heavenly glory that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share, that blessed life of the Trinity that they wish to bestow upon us. I see some of our youth are arriving if you have a question or two, I can probably squeeze one or two questions in. Otherwise, I'll be back by the couches after we conclude here, uh, chatting with our RCIA folks before they start phase two of our evening. Are there any quick questions or points of clarification you might have before we pray to close things down? Okay, well, it was either clear as crystal or clear as mud. Hopefully the former and not the latter. We're going to dive a little more deeply next week into the church. I touched already on some of the things about the mission of the church. We're going to look at the article of the church, the importance of the church, how the Holy Spirit works in the church, and some other things along those lines. So that will be next week's topics. Again, a reminder, we do have the little summary of important points. Be sure to pick one of those up. You can have that for further reference, uh, future reading, review if you want to go back and review some of the things that I talked about. Again, for those who are joining us via YouTube podcast, uh, there should be a link to that handout in the description with this video so you don't miss uh, the content when we post it. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so that you'll be notified when we do get uh, new content posted and you can check it out. Okay. While the rest of our youth are making their way down, let's go ahead and pray. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Holy Spirit, kindle this fire of love in our hearts. Increase our, our love for you, our love for the Father, our love for the Son. Increase our desire to keep growing in this relationship day by day. And let this increased love overflow in love for our neighbor. Make us like a chalice filled to the brim. I cannot help spreading your love everywhere that we go. 
so that others might come to know you, our advocate and guide, our paraclete and consoler, the spirit of the living God bestowed upon us in abundance. And help us see how you invite us each day to cooperate with you, to grow day by day in virtue, to recognize and reject temptation, and to choose what you choose for us, to love what you love, to desire what you desire, to follow where you wish to lead us, that your fruits might come to birth in us and in our lives and be a benefit to those around us. We make this great prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. Okay. Thank you again for joining us this evening. We hope that you have a a very blessed evening. We'll wait for our youth to come together, and then we'll again sing that uh, antiphon of the Salve Regina together.